2 Samuel chapter 7. We'll begin here by looking at verses 1 through 3. 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Then Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. David is a great man. The Lord, speaking of David in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, spoke of him that he was a man after God's own heart. And we see that in the life of David. But I don't think we see anything that clearly indicates the depth of his greatness as clearly as what we see in chapters 6 and 7 of 2 Samuel. In chapter 6, we have David taking the ark of the uh, covenant and bringing it to the city of Jerusalem which demonstrates to us his great love for God and his desire to worship him and we watch him as he worships before the Lord with all of his strength. In chapter 7 we see him as he's reposing in his luxurious palace in his castle that he has if you will in this this custom home a, a home that he refers to as being a, a house of cedar when he says he's living in a house of cedar, that's another way of saying, I live in a custom home. I live in a luxurious home. I'm in a situation where I'm at ease and content. God has given me rest from all of my enemies. And, and, and this man who is living in this beautiful paneled home, in this custom home, begins to think it's just not right. It's not right that I should live in a custom home while the ark of God is behind tent curtains. And so what we have an opportunity is seeing the heart of David and, and something of his grace. Greatness. You see, he succeeded in uniting the kingdom, and he's now there in this state of contentment. For him, life is good. He has wives, he has children, he has the love of his people, he's got fellowship with God. According to chapter 5 here in 2 Samuel, verse 10, David went on and became great. The Lord of hosts was with him. And so David is living a life that is at ease and at peace, and it's blessed by God. He had taken uh, Jerusalem from the Jebusites. He, he had a home built for him by Hiram, who is the king of Tyre. And uh, as I mentioned, it would have been beautiful and luxurious. It was proper for a king. But in his heart, uh, David knows that his blessings have come from God. And so as he's there and just resting in contentment, he's aware that God is the one who blesses. Like it says in Psalm 68, verse 19, Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. And that's how David saw his relationship with God, that God daily blesses him, loads him down with blessings because God is indeed his God, the God of salvation. He knew what James later would say to us in chapter 1, verse 17, how every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow nor turning. He knew that God is the one who gives us the blessings, and David just extolled God for that. He was grateful to God. And so he's been living in this lap of luxury, and, and he's now content. David, for some time, had, had lived the life of a fugitive. He had been hunted by King Saul. But it's all done now. He's at rest, and he's in a state of ease. He's, he's settled, and he's in comfort, and he's in peace. He's safe from his enemies. And as he's there, he begins to think about it. And so it says in verse 2, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar. The ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. And so he begins to think about the blessings of God. And he's beginning to think how that he had built the tabernacle there, a place for the ark of the covenant. But the fact is, the ark is there in a tent and I'm living in a custom home. And so he begins to speak to somebody who we're being introduced to here now in verse 2, a man by the name of Nathan the prophet. He's just brought into the scene. This was his confidant. This was his friend. This was a spiritual advisor. And this is somebody you'll see in the life of David often after this. But he's described to us simply as being Nathan the prophet. And as he's speaking to him, he's simply saying this. He's saying, I, I'm living in a permanent dwelling place. The ark's in a tent. And this is not, just not right. Something has to be done about this, and something should be done immediately. Now, this concern is the key to the greatness of David, the king of Israel. David cared about the things of God. His devotion to God, his love for God, his relationship with God was of such force and such nature, it was such a deep passion, that even as he's resting there, he begins to think 
Why is it that I'm in this beautiful home that took some time to build? And all this time, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God, has been there with the tent, in a tent. It's just not right. That, again, is the key to his greatness because he wants to do good for the Lord. So he speaks to Nathan. And he says to him what's on his heart. Well, notice Nathan's response in verse 3. Nathan says to the king, Go, do all that's in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Undoubtedly, this is something God would be pleased with, David. I don't even have to give this a moment's thought. You need to do what the Lord seems to have placed on your heart. You need to go and you need to build him a temple. The Lord is with you, is what Nathan says. Well, the fact is, the Lord was not intending to use David to build him a temple. And the reason is later on revealed to David. If you take notes, it's found in 1 Chronicles in chapter 22, verses 8 through 10. And in that passage, David makes it very clear that the Lord had said to him that I am not to build a temple for him because David says, God spoke to me and said, because you have been a man of war and you have blood on your hands. And so I don't want you, a, a warrior, to be building me a temple. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use a son that I'm going to give to you, and his name is Solomon, and Solomon is going to be the one who will build a house for my name. David, it's good that you desire to do that, but I have no plans for you to do that. I actually have plans in the future for a temple, but that plan does not include you constructing it. You were a warrior, you have bloody hands, and I'm not going to allow you to do that. And so what we find here is Nathan saying to him, go and do all that is in your heart, the Lord is with you. But in reality, this isn't something that the Lord is moving Nathan to say, because notice verse 4. It happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? What this reveals to us very briefly is that Nathan, though he was a prophet, didn't always speak for God because God here has to redirect him. A moment before, as we read in verse 3, it had said, Go and do all that's in your heart. The Lord is with you. But now God redirects him. You see, in his normal dealings with David, he was undoubtedly wise and thoughtful. He was highly respected. But not everything he told David was inspired by God. And this is one of those examples. When he approved David's idea, he was moved by his own feelings. He gave his own advice. He didn't give advice from the Lord. And so now God gives clear direction, a distinct message. And he says, and I want you to take this to David. And this is what he says, verse 5. He says, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord. Would you build a house for me to dwell in? He says, I've got something for you to do. I want you to go and I want you to speak to David. And this is what I have to say. Now briefly, I want to point something out to you. I want you to notice here in verse 5 how David is referred to. I want you to see this with me because I'm going to give you a real brief uh, insight into something here. Notice how he says, Tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build a house for me to dwell in. Notice how God refers to David. God does not say, go and speak to the leader. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, go and speak to the one whom I have set up as king. He doesn't say, go tell King David. Notice what he calls him. He calls him my servant. Now, you might want to note that because in Scripture, very often when God is intending to put a person in a place of what would be called greatness, this is how he re refers to them. He speaks to those whom he's using in great ways in this way. It's like when he said, my servant Abraham. Or he speaks of my servant Moses, my servant Job, my, my servant Isaiah, uh, my servant Jacob. God, when he's speaking concerning greatness in his kingdom, has a tendency of saying, if you're going to be great, you're going to be a servant. When Jesus was speaking about it one time, it's found in Mark chapter 9, verse 35. When Jesus was speaking to his 12, when he was speaking to the apostles, he, he said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. On, on another occasion, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, he said, the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. We have it backwards. We have it backwards. Sometimes we think that 
that person of high position, that person of high prestige within the body of Christ, the pastor even, we sometimes look at them as being special or different or unique. In reality, they're supposed to be the servant. I'm supposed to be the servant of this fellowship, not, not the taskmaster, not, not the king over people, but a servant. And unfortunately today, I think that we've gotten that backwards, and a lot of times people treat the uh, chief servant as if he is uh, more like dignity and, and all. And the Lord says, no, that's not what you're to do. I want you to go and speak, and I want you to speak to my servant, and I want you to tell him something. And here's what I want you to say. Uh, ask him, would you build a house for me to dwell in? Now he reminds him, in the history of Israel, I've never asked for one. I've never dwelt in a house from the time uh, uh, that I began working with you up to this day. I, I've never asked. I've never required a permanent dwelling place. I've preferred to move around. Um, notice verse 7, I've preferred the tent. I haven't commanded you to build me a house. Have I ever asked for a house? No, I haven't. So, verse 8, now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I've been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Let me rehearse my relationship with you, David. I want you to remember something as I speak to you. I want you to remember that you at one time were just a young shepherd boy. I want you to remember that I removed you from being a shepherd and I brought you to the place that I could make you king. And I made you king over my sheep, over the nation of Israel. David, like Moses, who learned the secret of leadership at the backside of a desert, caring for the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, how that Moses, when he was 40 years of age, how it came into his mind that God was going to use him to deliver the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. And how that he went that day and he saw that Egyptian taskmaster mistreating one of, your, one of Moses' Hebrew brethren. And how the Bible says that Moses looked to the left and looked to the right and, and promptly slew this, this taskmaster and buried his body in the sand. One of the things, by the way, when you read the story of Moses and how he did that, you fail to realize something sometimes just by reading that. You fail to realize that the taskmasters of Egypt were, were vicious men, were greatly feared, who would beat them and mistreat them. And, and, and the slaves were of great fear towards this man because he had so much power and very often was so brutal. And when you read that story, how it points out that Moses looked to the left and he looked to the right, Moses, in other words, didn't think a thing about him. He wasn't afraid of this guy at all. He just looked to see, is anybody watching? So Moses, we know, was trained in all of the knowledge of the Egyptians. We see that in Acts chapter 7. But a lot of times people don't realize that Moses being, being set up, in other words, being uh, prepared to possibly become Pharaoh, would have gone through all of the schools that Egypt had to offer, all the schools which included military school, which included military training, which means that Moses was a martial artist, and therefore when he saw this, this guy doing what he was doing, it didn't even cross his mind that he should be afraid of him. He looked at him, and he looked to the left, he looked to the right, nobody seems to be watching, and he dusted, he killed him, then he buried him. And the Bible tells us that Moses thought that the people would know that by that action he had been sent by God to deliver them. But the one who was in the wrong the next day was starting to have a problem with a fellow Jew. Moses said, your brethren, what's the problem here? And the one who was in the wrong said to him, what are you going to do, kill me like you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Now wait a minute, there was nobody there except for somebody who's being mistreated and a taskmaster. Who do you think it was that was being mistreated who is now turning on Moses? It was the one that he had delivered just the day before. And as he sees this take place, he says to Moses, he says to him, what are you going to do? You're going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian? It got out, Pharaoh heard about it, and we all know the story that Moses went out to earn his degree. He got a BD degree, backside of the desert degree. He was out there for 40 years. And while he was in the wilderness for 40 years, he was caring for his father's flock, his sheep. And as he did so, within the first 40 years of his life, he thought himself to be something. But the next 40 years of his life, he discovered that he's nothing. 
And God took that something, taught him that he's nothing, so that when he was 80, he became God's man to be the deliverer of the children of Israel. And even as Moses, when he was out in that wilderness, discovered that he was to be one who cares for sheep, ultimately he didn't realize he'd have two million of them in a wilderness that he was going to care for. God used that in his life to train him in leadership principles in the same way God took David, gave him small things to do. He was faithful to the Lord, and he says, I took you from the sheepfold, and I made you a shepherd over my people. That's what I did. And God is saying, I used your early training to teach you certain things about caring for others. That's why David could write Psalm 23 with this strong passion, the Lord is my shepherd. He understood that. He understood what it meant to be a shepherd, and he understood what it meant that the, the Lord was his shepherd. And, 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 and we can look at Jesus in John chapter, chapter 10, verse 11, where Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And so, David, I have raised you up. You were a young shepherd, but I have made you a shepherd over my own sheep. And notice in verse 9 how he says, And I've been with you wherever you've gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. And God continues speaking to him and says, Now listen, I've been with you all the way. Listen, when you fought Goliath, who was with you? Who was your shield? Who was your strength? It was me. When you were eluding Saul, who is it that kept you protected? It was me. When you fought the Philistines, I gave you victory. Even when you took Jerusalem from the Jebusites, I was the one who gave you victory. I have been with you every step of the way. And the victories I have given you resulted in something. It results in fame. It results in a great name. And people hear about you throughout the land. David was aware of this because in Psalm 18, verses 37 through 39, he says, I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn back till they were destroyed. I have wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet. For you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. I had victory. You gave it to me. And that's what God is saying. God is making it very clear, I have been with you. Verse 10, moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them anymore as previously since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. I will appoint a place for my people Israel. You will possess the land that has been given to you. They have a history of being exiled, that's true, but God's promise to the nation of Israel remains intact. In Ezekiel, as we're studying Ezekiel on Wednesday nights, in chapter 37, it says at verse 25, they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob my servant, where your fathers dwelt. They shall dwell there, they, their children, their children's children forever. My servant David shall be their prince forever. Amos 9 verse 15, I will plant them in their land. No longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. And so he says, I've given you a land. Not only that, notice verse 11, and the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. David, you wanted to build a temple, but I'm going to give you a dynasty. You wanted to do something great for me, but I will do something greater for you. You can never outgive God. You can never outdo God. You just can't. It was in your heart to build me something. I'm going to build you something. You wanted to give to me. I've got something better for you. When Paul was writing in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, he said, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. The God who is blessing David is the same God who wants to bless us. And God was saying to him, I'm going to do a work. I'm going to be a blessing to you. And I'm going to make you a house. Now notice verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, 
and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build for my name, a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. And so God gives him a promise. Now the promise has what you call a dual application. One, it applies to David's lineage of kings that will be his offspring from Solomon, his son, forward. So that means verses uh, 14 and 15 would pertain to those that are being referred to. That would speak of God disciplining David's seed when it's necessary. Notice how it says in verse 14, I'll be his father, he'll be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I, re uh, whom I removed from before you. So one application would obviously be the future for David, the dynasty that he has. He'll have sons that God chastens. But there's a second application because when you look at verses uh, 12 and uh, 13 and verse 16, this is a, what is called messianic prophecies. This is speaking concerning a greater son that David's going to have, one as we know as Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And that's what he's speaking about. Because the second application is, is David's greater son, the Messiah. Jesus' human lineage is derived from King David. That's why he's called the son of David. When you open, open up the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 1, and you begin to read the very first verse, it says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Later in Matthew, in chapter 22, verse 42, Jesus asked a question. He said, what do you think about the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. And so this is in reference to Jesus Christ. It's a future reference to the Messiah who will be from David's lineage from the tribe of Judah. Now notice in verse 16 when it says, Your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. When you look at that and cross-reference that with Luke chapter 1 in the New Testament, verses 31 through 33, you see how this is fulfilled in Jesus. Because to Mary it was said, You will conceive in your womb, bring forth a son, shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, will be called the Son of the Highest, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom of his kingdom there will be no end. So you have a twofold application. One is the lineage that is descending from David, from Solomon on. Secondly, the messianic prophecy related to his greater son, Jesus the Messiah, who fulfills that literally. Now, according to verse 17, all these words, and according to all his vision, uh, Nathan spoke to David. So he went and faithfully delivered what the Lord had given to him. Now, as he does this, I want you to see David's response. David prays. Verse 18. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God? What is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet, this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. You have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? Now, what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. For your word's sake, according to your own heart, you've done all these great things to make your servant know them. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God. There's none like you, nor is there any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people, like Israel, the one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for himself a name, and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land? before your people whom you redeemed, for yourself from Egypt, the nations and their gods. For you have made your people Israel your very own people forever. 
and you, Lord, have become their God. Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever, and do as you have said. Let your name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel. Let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. And now, O oh Lord God, you are God. Your words are true, and you have promised this goodness to your servant. Now, therefore, let it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue before you forever. For you, O oh Lord God, have spoken it. And with your blessing, let the house of your servant be blessed forever. What a refreshing prayer. And notice how it begins. I want to point something out to you very briefly. Notice verse 18 where David simply begins his prayer by saying, Who am I, O Lord God? Who am I? What a great question to ask. Who am I? We live in an age when that kind of question might not be asked by the typical person because there's not an awful lot of humility in the heart of the average person. So they would say, instead of who am I, they'd say, well, why not? Bottom line is, David had humility. How do you receive humility? How do you grow in humility? How do you grow in the grace of humility? Sometimes people want to have humility, and so they do all kinds of strange things. They dress funny. They eat weird foods. They go and live in sparse climates or whatever. They think that that's going to teach them humility. But does it really teach them humility? The easiest way for a person to gain humility is to simply gain perspective. And the way, way you gain perspective is simply through contrast. And the way you gain perspective through contrast is simply spending time with God. When you begin to see God for who He is and you begin to see yourself for who you are, by contrast, the result is going to be humility. Many years ago, my mom had a mirror that was used at that time for putting on makeup. Women would use it for makeup. Uh, today men do too. But then back in 1964, it was a makeup mirror. And uh, I liked that mirror because it was portable. Like, but it had a light on it and you could actually push the buttons and it could be like uh, inside light, it could be daylight, it could be night light, it, it had different settings and, and I can remember at about the age of 14 I would use it when I would comb my hair and everything and, and I can remember that, that I could put the settings on whatever I liked and, and when I put it on in the nighttime lighting I looked good, I, I looked good in the dark. But man when I put it on to daylight I, I saw every blemish that every 14 year old has. I saw that and I go, oh man, you look bad in the light, so it's better to keep in the dark. And in a lot of ways, that's how people are to this day morally. They don't like walking in the light because the light shows them their error. It shows them their imperfection. It, it, it shows up what you are. So people don't come to the light, Jesus says, because they love the darkness. They enjoy the darkness because their deeds are dark. They like to live in the light, they, in the darkness rather. They stay in the darkness because they're more comfortable and they have all their friends who are there with them in the darkness. Well, if you live in the darkness, you, you are basically blind. I mean, not that long ago, a, a, a fish was drawn up from this very deep river and, and the fish didn't have any eyes because the fish didn't need eyes because it's always in the darkness and therefore doesn't need eyes to see things in light. It doesn't have the sense of sight. And there are people today with, without God. The Lord is not in their life. And therefore they walk around like that fish. They're blind. They cannot see. So they feel that they're fine in the dark. Everybody's beautiful in the dark. It's when you come out into the light that your imperfections are shown. And I can remember that. When I was a kid, I would look at myself at my mom's light, and, and if it was a nighttime light, I looked fine. When I put it under full daylight, then I would see my imperfections, and nobody really likes to see their imperfections. But if you want to have humility, what you do is you dwell in the light of God. You spend time with the Lord. The closer you get to Him, the more of your own imperfection you see. And the more of your own imperfection you see, the more humbled you are, which causes you to cast yourself on Him and to say, Oh Lord, who am I? And God, look at how you have blessed me. I don't deserve these blessings. 
You know, again, a lot of Americans think we deserve a lot more than we have. We should have more. Everybody's owed certain things, of course. People think that way. But then there are others who say, you know, I'm just grateful for what I do have. I'm grateful for what God has given to me, a roof over my head and food on my table and a car to drive and a woman who loves me, neighbors who are kind. We begin to count our blessings. We begin to understand that we, we don't run around saying, well, we deserve more. We realize that what we have is a blessing from the hand of God, and we're grateful for it. David was. Who am I, O oh Lord God? I was just a shepherd. Who am I? You took me from following the sheep as the youngest of my father's family of boys, and you displaced a king by the name of Saul and put me in that position. I wanted to build you a house, but you said you're going to give to me a dynasty, and I have such a difficult time grabbing hold of that. You see, David saw himself in contrast to the goodness of God and the greatness of God. In Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4, you can almost picture David as a young boy out there in the middle of a of a meadow with all those sheep and it's beautiful night there in Israel as he's looking up at these countless stars because when you've been out in Israel and you've been out in an area where there's no light it's just wilderness it's just dark the stars pop they're just so beautiful they just stand out and and David was there as a as a young one and and he writes in Psalm 8 verses 3 and 4 when I consider your heavens the work of your fingers the moon and the stars which you have set in place what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You know, when he was looking at these things, he didn't look up and say, oh, how wonderful I am. He looked and said, how wonderful you are, how great and majestic and powerful you are, God. What is man that you would even consider him? What is man that you want to bless him? What is man that you take care of him? And so he begins with humility. If you want to have humility, draw close to the Lord. Spend time in his word. Spend time in prayer. Have godly friends who are influences for good in your life. Learn to share your faith with other people and, and to see God show up in those moments when you're, when you're sharing about him. And, and you'll grow, and you'll grow day by day. And so David's saying, who am I, Lord? What is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet, he goes on in verse 19, this, this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. You have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? Being raised to the throne is a small thing, he's saying, in comparison to what you've promised me. Is this a manner of man? Well, of course not. You bless me beyond anything a man could do. It's not what men would do for other men. They cannot bless as you have blessed me, and I am overwhelmed by this. Verse 20, and now what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. What can I say? You know my heart. God knows your heart. There are some who will take that phrase and extend it as permission to continue sinning. And so they'll say, well, you shouldn't come down on me because God knows my heart. Well, yes, Jeremiah says it. God knows your heart. It's desperately wicked. God knows my heart. That's true. Of course he does. He knows all things about me. But at the same time, when you have a heart after the Lord, no, you're not perfect on this face of the earth. No, in your lifetime, you will not be perfect. You go through a process where God works in your life throughout your life, and then you end up going to be with him. But you're imperfect throughout your, your earthly days. That's just the bottom line, and that's just the truth. But at the same time, you grow closer to him daily and desire more of him daily you will fail. You will sin. You will do wrong. But you don't glory in that and you don't walk away from that saying, no big deal, God is gracious, he forgives me. I remember counseling a woman many years ago 
who said to me, God has a perfect will and God has a permissive will. God's permissive will was that I should have married my husband who was seated across from her when she was saying this. His perfect will is for me to divorce my husband and marry his best friend, which she did. She divorced her husband and married his best friend because she said God's perfect will was for me to be with his best friend and I was out of the will of God when I married this man here. And uh, you couldn't reason with her. You, you couldn't say this is a perversion of the grace of God and the leading of the Spirit. You couldn't give her scripture. She didn't, you know, want to hear it. She just went out and did what she wanted to do. There are people like that all the time. God knows me. He knows my heart. He knows the weakness of my flesh. He knows that I can't keep away from those women. He just knows it's in me. When all the bells and, and whistles are going off, there's nothing I can do. I have to go through with what I was desiring to do. God gives me grace. And they do that. They say that. They argue that. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying that David was saying here is, God, you know me. You know my heart. You know my desire. Remember in 1 Samuel 13, 14, David is a man after God's heart. God, you know me. You know everything about me. Even in my failures, you still know that my heart is yours. I want to serve you. I have a desire. I love you. I have a passion for you. That's why in Psalm 139, it's so powerful. Verses 1 through 3, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You have my... You know my sitting down, my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path, my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. You know everything about me. God knows everything about you. God knows everything about you. You have a testimony that you give to people, and you have a testimony only you and God really know. And that testimony that only you and God know will remain with you. You don't want people to know exactly how bad you really were. I don't want people to know my real testimony, so I only give them certain aspects of it. God knows it all. He knows everything from the beginning to the end. And he still loves me. And that is too wonderful for me. And David understands that. It's not an excuse to continue in sin. It's an awareness of what God has done for you. And David is saying that, God, you know me. You know I wanted to build you a temple. You know my heart is to build you a temple. There I am, leisurely laying in my palace, thinking about your ark there in a tent. You know I wanted to build you a temple. But you gave me a dynasty. Notice what else he says here. Verse 21, For your word's sake and according to your own heart, you have done all these great things to make your servant know them. Lord, you have made the promise, and I will take you at your word. For your word's sake, I will take you at your word. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God. There's none like you, nor is there any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. There's no God like you at all. Your goodness to me reveals what a great God you are, and I love you, and I will serve you, because there's no one else in this universe like you. Verse 23, who is like your people, like Israel, the one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for himself a name, and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land, before your people whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, the nations, and their gods. You've been good to me, but you've also been good to the nation. In the midst of a world that is lost, you redeemed us and you delivered us. Because when God took Moses and said, I'm going to use you to deliver my children. And when God used him to bring those ten plagues on the nation of Egypt, and, and when you read the, the, the plagues and how it took place in chapters 7 through 11 there in the book of Exodus, when you get into chapter 12, verse 12, God says there, I have judged the gods of Egypt. I have delivered you from their hand. I have judged them. And you know, in this redemption, in this bringing them out, using the blood that was there on the lintel of the door for Passover, and how the death angel passed over and did not kill the firstborn of those who were covered by the blood, even so to this day, God redeems. Even to this day, God brings out of bondage. 
There are people in this room, if we were to give you opportunity, and if you had the, the ability to, you could stand up and say, I've been redeemed from alcoholism. I've been redeemed from promiscuity. I've been redeemed from, from drug abuse. I've been uh, redeemed from, from a violent temper. I've been, there are so many people in this church who, if they had a moment to give their testimony, could stand up and say, God's blood, Jesus Christ poured his blood out for me, and he changed my life as a result of that. Jesus spoke concerning the fact that when somebody uh, commits sin, Jesus said that man is a slave to sin. But he said, the one who knows the Son will be made free, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And he who is free in the Son is free completely, is free indeed. And that's what happens. When you commit your heart to Christ and you begin to pursue him, you are taken out of bondage. I've talked to too many people, including my own testimony I understand what it means to be in bondage. And I've talked to too many people who have been at one time in bondage and they give this glowing testimony of how at one time they were stuck in a lifestyle that was going nowhere and destructive for all around and how God redeemed them. And God pulled them out. God saved them. God transformed them. God changed them completely. You see, God still redeems he still brings us out of bondage. He does it by the gospel of grace. He does it through the truth that's been revealed to us through Jesus Christ. Now he goes on and he says, you have made your people, Israel, your very own people, forever. And you, Lord, have become their God. You gave them the land of Israel. You firmly planted them. And in doing so, you fulfilled your promise. David secured the land for the nation. He defeated the Philistines and the other enemies. And God kept his promise to them. He made them a nation, a nation that will continue perpetually. And now, O oh Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you have said. Let your name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel. Let the house of your servant David be established before you. Notice verse 28. And now, O Lord God, you are God. Your words are true. You have promised this goodness to your servant. Your words are true. Do you believe them or do you not? If you believe God's word, you can be free. You can be free. I was just talking, I've, 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 I've had this conversation several times this week with people. Several times. Do you believe or do you not? In between services just today, I was speaking to a, a young lady about this, and I said, you have two options. Be free or be in prison. Those are your options. Which do you want? What do you want? You can be free. You can take God's word and trust him. You can believe you know, the Bible tells us in Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Has he spoken? Will he not make it good? God doesn't make false promises. And God promised me that if I came to Jesus, he would not cast me out. He promised me that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses me from all sin. He promised me that if I came to him, I would be a new creature. Old things would be passed away. All things would become new. He promised me that he would never leave me nor forsake me. He promised me that I would receive power after that the Holy Spirit had come upon me and I would be a witness to him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. He said to me that my name is now written in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus Christ said to me, I have gone to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I have many exceedingly precious promises from God, and I want to embrace them, and I want to hold fast to them, and I want to trust Him, and I want to live by those things. So I have options. Is God's word true or is it not? He says to me, if you confess your sin, I am faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. Not just some of it. Not just the unrighteousness that I was carrying up to the moment that I confessed him. All unrighteousness. Past, present, and yes, even future. 
God can take care of those things. And so I take him at his word. Problem is, is I don't always act in faith upon those things that I truly should believe. I'm a confessing Christian sometimes and a practical atheist in my behavior. I act as if God really doesn't exist. When in reality, here I am saying, but I know he does. There are many like that. But David said, no, you are God and your words are true and you have promised this goodness to your servant and I'm holding you to your promise. Listen, parents or grandparents now, if you promise your five-year-old something for their birthday that they really want, do they let you forget or are they anything like I used to be, and perhaps you used to be? You said, you said, where is it? You said, well, yeah, I, 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 I know I said. No, you said, where is it? And they go through all the little presents, and they say, where is it? Where's what? You said, you know, I, my, my kids were that way. It's funny. They didn't remember me saying, clean the room, but they did remember me saying I'd give them something. They did. You know what? Children have a tendency of remembering promises, especially if it touches their heart and it's something they want. What is it that we're supposed to be if it's not children? What is it that Jesus said to us concerning little children and that we're to be like one? What does that mean? It's many things, including the fact that a child doesn't forget a promise and trusts the one who made it. And when Jesus Christ said, you can have life, when Jesus Christ said, you need to be born again to enter into the kingdom of God, and if you are uh, born again, you will enter his kingdom, that's a promise, and you can hold fast to it. You can hold fast to it. You can bank on it. It's 100% sure. David held fast to the promise. Now, he wanted to build the Lord a house. In the book of Acts, God asked the question, what kind of house are you going to build me, seeing that I made all things? I mean, come on. I mean, you come and you try and build me something you think is good enough for me. There's nothing good enough for me. I just was pleased to dwell there. I chose to dwell there. But no, no. What's interesting is that God gave him, by the Spirit, the plans. You see it in uh, First Chronicles in chapters 28 and 29. Gave him, by the Spirit, the plans, and David also put forth the money. And the money that David put forth with some of the leadership amounted to over $140 billion dollars to build this temple. A hundred and forty billion dollars to build the temple. And he gave it freely because he wanted the Lord to have a house. And the interesting thing about David, God said to David, you cannot build it, but that doesn't mean that David didn't leave something so that the house could be built. He gave his son Solomon the plans and he said, God gave me these and I'm giving them to you. You make sure you do this the right way, son. David's legacy lived on through his son because he put away the money and he had the plans from the Spirit and he gave it to his son. Now, as I said a moment ago, God doesn't dwell in a temple made with human hands. So God decided to build his own temple. And that's what you are and that's what I am when we receive Christ. Because Paul says, know you not that your body is the temple of the Spirit of God. And so God doesn't dwell in structures like this. God dwells in people like us. We have him within us because we gave our hearts to Christ and said, God, be merciful to us. We're sinners. Enter into my life. Forgive me. And I became a temple of the living God. And God's word is true. His promises are sure. And he lives within us if we've received him even now.